In order to compete the best they possibly can in 2024, the New Orleans Saints are going to need some big-time breakout seasons from some very important players. We get all that and a little bit of land yap for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? I am your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credential member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're taking a look at breakout players and we're going to also take a look at a potential, not even potential, I think we're for sure ready for a kicker battle in New Orleans as well. We're going to get to that, but we're also going to be taking a look at the players that the New Orleans Saints need to have breakout seasons and my vote for breakout player of the year on offense and on defense for this New Orleans Saints team in 2024. If they're going to want to compete this year, they're going to need breakouts from some important players. Let's find out who they are. We appreciate you very much, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day and for being an everydayer here watching the show or listening to the show. However, it is that you take it in, and we appreciate you very much for joining us here for another episode of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more, and right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets by simply winning your first $5 bet. That's it, 200 bucks for winning your first bet. Head over to FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So my number one pick, for breakout player of the year for the New Orleans Saints in 2024 is going to go over to the defensive side. Last year, my two picks over on defense were Malcolm Roach on the interior as well as Carl Granderson over on the outside. I think we did pretty well on the Carl Granderson side of that. And Malcolm Roach played extremely well up until his injury as well, was one of the premier run stoppers in the NFL, now a Denver Bronco. And I'm going to stick on the defensive line here. And I think this year's breakout candidate for me On the defensive side is defensive tackle Brian Brzee. The second year player had a really solid first year, four and a half sacks, seven tackles for a loss, also put nine hits on the quarterback, totaled a total of 24 tackles, 12 of which solo. Um, Great percentages in terms of run stop percentage as well. And that's one of the things that I really want to highlight here. When it comes to Brzee, it's not just going to be about the sacks, okay? It's going to be about how he mucks up the interior and starts to help to limit this run game that the New Orleans Saints have not been great at defending over the course of the past couple of seasons. It deeply into the bottom half of the league in the last two years when it came to team run defense. And Brian Brzee has got to be a part of that solution. Now, he doesn't have to do it all on his own. There's Colin Saunders, there's Nathan Shepard, there's Jack Heflin, there's you know a guy like Tano Passanio, Peyton Turner, who can move inside and outside. And we'll see If they add more talent on the defensive interior, I think that they certainly should be interested in doing that. And so it's not all going to come down to him, but he's going to have to be the leader of that unit once he's ready to step into that leadership role. The question is, will he be ready to step into that leadership role in his second year? That's going to be a big thing for me. So not only am I looking for, you know, him to continue to be a disruptive pass rusher. That's why you drafted him in the first round. That was one of the reasons why he wasn't just, you know, a second round or third round guy athletic, hyper-athletic, and he could get after the quarterback. That's what makes you a round one defensive tackle. Can you limit the biggest part of the game and can you affect the most important player for the other team? That's the quarterback. So you got to be able to do that. So if he ends up with six, six and a half sacks this season in his next year, fantastic. That's great coming from the interior. He doesn't have to be a double digit sack guy. If he is, fantastic. But that's not what you need to be a breakout player as a defensive tackle. But if you can also lead the way and move into double digits when it comes to those tackles for a loss, get more consistent in terms of getting your hands on the opposing quarterback, whether it be a sack or at least just a hit on the quarterback, let them know you're around, let them know you're there, you know, that kind of game, uh, while also helping this team take a noticeable and much needed step forward as a run defense, then boom, there's your breakout season there for Brian Brzee in his second year. My second breakout candidate is also a second year player as well. And I want to say right now, me and my good friend Ryan Hinton are on the same page when it comes to this. It's not just Brian Brzee over on the defensive side, but on the offensive side, 
It's running back Kendra Miller. Week 18 against the Falcons was kind of his game, right? I don't want to call it his breakout game, but it was his arrival game, right? Average 5.6 yards per attempt, 73 rushing yards in total. Also found the end zone uh, on a rushing touchdown. Uh, Also added over 100 yards this season as a receiver, including a big catch and run earlier in the year as well. But it was really this Falcons game that I think is the one that made you go like, oh, okay, I see it. I see where the explosiveness is. I see the patience. I see the vision. I see all of it, right? I see the vision. Uh, you know, but you, know, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, that was the game that made you kind of go, I understand. I get it. You know what I mean? Now he's got to stay healthy and he's got to stay on the field. And that's going to be a big part of that breakout criteria is can he stay on the field and can he contribute consistently to the team by being on the field. I think if he's on the field, he's going to contribute. Question is, can he manage that? Now, he had a bunch of weird stuff that went on. I mean, at one point, he had like a lockjaw situation during training camp. And then, of course, he has the knee. He had some other injuries and things like that. So maybe this was hope. Maybe it was just kind of one of those things that you deal with throughout your rookie season and your body gets used to the next level of the game or your body gets used to the regiment, whatever it might be, right? Like we have to remember that when players make the leap from college to the NFL, it's not just the game that changes. Their entire life changes. The way that they, the time that they wake up every morning changes. What they do when they wake up every morning changes. How they work changes. How they prepare changes. The criteria and the, the not necessarily the criteria, but the rubric under which they're evaluated changes. Everything changes when you go from college to the NFL. The good news is that for a running back, for the most part, the roles are at least baseline transferable. I'm not saying that the entire role is transferable, but it's not like a tight end where everything in your life is changing. And oh, by the way, you have to learn how to play a new position, even though it's called the same thing in the NFL, because your responsibilities are so wildly different as a tight end in most systems in college, getting to a tight end in most systems in the NFL. Running back, that leap, not as steep. And therefore, what you're dealing with and managing is how do you manage yourself? How do you manage everything changing around you? Now that he's got a year of it under his belt, can he keep it going and keep the momentum from that 73-yard rushing day against the Atlanta Falcons to close out the season going? Remember, one of the reasons why we chose Carl Granderson last year as a breakout player was because of momentum at the end of the 2022 season. Kendra Miller has some momentum at the end of the 2023 season. Can he carry it forward to 2024? And these aren't the only players, by the way, that are breakout candidates. These are simply my picks. There are some players that the New Orleans Saints absolutely need a breakout from, and one of which, even though it might be unfair to say, is Derek Carr. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I asked you this question not too long ago. Let me ask you again. How does your social battery recharge, right? Like when you're already kind of socialed out or you're feeling a little bit drained, how do you recharge that battery? For some people, it's like me. I like being around people. Being around people recharges me, which allows me to do and make through make it through the times where I have to be with myself. It sounded so sad, but you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Being alone is what drains me, not being around people. Other people are the opposite way. Being alone recharges them, but being around other people in a social situation drains them. These are the things that are important to know about yourself because you need to know how to make sure that you're setting up a social life that doesn't just drain your battery, but that instead recharges you as well. And a big part of helping me understand that was therapy. And if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is where you need to go. I want you to go and check it out today because you're going to be able to find your social sweet spot, if you will, uh, with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Don't forget, we are your team every day. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to also go and check out the Locked on Sports today, the first ever national sports 24-7 stream on YouTube. You can find it. Uh, And don't worry, you don't have to worry about covering your ears with all the ESPN and Fox Sports recklessness and all the screaming and yelling and shouting. There's nothing like that. It's the local experts that are actually there, actually covering the team, just like we do here on Locked on Saints. You can go check it out today at Locked on Sports today on YouTube or wherever you find uh, 
other things like uh, the Fire TV channels app, which is free as well. So make sure you go and check that out. Locked on sports today. All right. So um, take a look here at breakout candidates in today's episode. We reference my two picks for breakout candidates. But the fact is that the New Orleans Saints are going to need uh, some breakout years from certain guys uh, in 2023. And a lot of them, or excuse me, 2024, and a lot of them are going to be on the offensive side and not the least of which being. Derek Carr, the most important player on the field, the quarterback, or the most important position on the field. Um, And look, this isn't me. I know that some people might hear me say this and might say, well, what do you mean breakout? He played great last year. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by breakout. First of all, in my opinion, Derek Carr did not play, quote, great last year. He played great towards the end of last year. He played well towards the end of last year. And so again, we're talking momentum. Can he carry that momentum? with him into 2024. So that's why I'm jumping from Kendry Miller over here to the Derek Carr conversation. Uh, In the last, just looking at the last five games, or last four games for Derek Carr, um, he ended up throwing uh, three touchdowns against the Giants for 218 yards, three touchdowns against the Rams for 319 yards. He threw two more touchdowns against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for 197 yards, then threw 264 yards and four touchdowns in the final week against the Atlanta Falcons. And in that time, threw only one interception. And in 2024 uh, or 2023, he only threw eight interceptions as a whole. So he wasn't careless with the ball. I don't think he had. No, he didn't have a single multi-interception game. We just didn't see any of those things. So he did a good job taking care of the ball, but it felt like there was a lack of aggression in a lot of cases. And some of that felt like it might have come down to maybe trust with the receivers or whatever it was. But certainly once things started to kind of iron out around week 12 or after week 12, then we really saw things get moving. Those last five games, even if we include the game against Carolina, where he threw two touchdowns for 119 yards to one interception, uh, that's still fine. Uh, And that's still a game that they won handily, 28 to 6 in that matchup. So I think that there are just certain things here that we can look at and we could say, okay, if you're throwing for a 118.9 passer rating over the course of the last five games, if you're throwing 14 touchdowns to two interceptions over the last five games, if you're completing 74% of your passes over the last five games, there's momentum there. So can you carry that into 2024 with a new system? And that's why I think that the New Orleans Saints need that breakout year from um, from Derek Carr. It's not that Derek Carr hasn't had good years, great years in his past. You need him to break out in your system for your team now, right? He's probably had his breakouts or he definitely has had his breakouts with the Raiders. Where's your breakout with the Saints? That's got to happen this year for the New Orleans Saints to be competitive in 2024. And I'm going to be honest with you. I like the system that they're installing. I like what it is that they're doing. I think that the draft and how they add talent and continue to build the roster over the course of the rest of free agency leading into training camp is going to be the biggest thing. But if they can do that and they can add those pieces, if they can build the roster that they want to build and that they need to build, Derek Carr having a breakout season could lead to this team being a playoff team. But you can't be a playoff team unless you get the breakout season from Derek Carr. You can't have one without the other, but one might lead to the other. So that's why I say Derek Carr, that's a must when it comes to a breakout season, specifically referring to his time with this team in his second year with the New Orleans Saints. And I think the new offensive system can help him get there as well. Speaking of guys that are going to benefit from the new offensive system, let's talk about a player that we continuously gloss over when we talk about replacing Michael Thomas, shall we? How about wide receiver A.T. Perry? In the last seven games of 2023, he had only 12 receptions. However, during that time, He averaged over 35 yards per game, 246 uh, receiving yards in total, and four touchdowns. So even if we took that and we doubled that, right? We went from 17 games to 14 games, and we're talking about just under 500 yards, about 24 receptions, we're talking about eight touchdowns, okay? That's a very efficient season. It's an unrealistically efficient season, but let's back down the touchdowns to six touchdowns or something like that. If you get that year out of A.T. Perry, you're very happy with that. But here's the thing, his role is going to open him up for even more production than that. If he ends up being the X receiver over on the opposite side, really replacing Michael Thomas, which right now the Saints don't have the option on their roster outside of A.T. Perry to replace Michael Thomas, unless they look at Michael Thomas, unless they're trying to replace 
more of his inside out ability, the fact that he can play outside and in the slot, then maybe that's where Cedric Wilson can come into play right now. But right now you got five receivers on the roster and you got to add more. You got to continue to add. And I think that the draft is the place to do that. All of that. We talked about Brendan Rice, the USC wide receiver. In yesterday's Mock Draft Monday episode, we talked about Keon Coleman before out of Florida State. Um, You know, there's a lot of Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina. There's a lot of these players that could be that guy. But A.T. Perry could be in that running as well. And so if the Saints don't overly invest moving forward in an X receiver, they need the breakout season from A.T. Perry. And so if his role allows him for more opportunities, ask for 24 catches for under 500 yards and for would that be 500, no, 492 yards, um, then you take that and you, know, you look at, let's say, six touchdowns instead of four. That's way under what you should be asking for if he's going to be the primary split end you know, uh, 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 wide out all by himself over on the weak side as a receiver. And so you're looking for the breakout from him. So it, this could be an opportunity here for A.T. Perry to also see a big time breakout season as well. One that I think that we would all absolutely welcome because we're all fans of A.T. Perry's game here. Um, lastly, I want to continue on with momentum here. We're sticking over in the offensive side. Another player that needs a breakout year. The Saints need him to break out, but he himself kind of needs a breakout year as well is tight end Juwan Johnson. Had a really strong finish to the season in 2022. He was a guy that we had looked at as a potential breakout player in 2020, uh, in 2023. Uh, maybe 2022 was more of the breakout because in 2023, it just didn't come together the way that you would have hoped. Now, he wasn't able to play in week four, was inactive weeks five, six, and seven, missed all of those games. It took time for him to come back off of that injury as well. Uh, But then when the targets really kind of started to flow, and again, towards the end of the season, we were looking at things from like the last five games of the year, three of his four touchdowns were in three of those five games. You really say three of the last four games, caught 70% of his passes over the course of those last five games. And uh, of his uh, total seasons numbers in terms of receptions, uh, which was 37, 19 of them came in those last five games, and of his 368 receiving yards on the season, 226 of them came in those last five games as well. So you watch his you know, uh, reception yards per game tick up. You watch his receptions uh, per game tick up, all of those things. So that's what you're looking for from Juwan Johnson. And look, I think that he's talented enough to get it done. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think that his injury and Derek Carr's injury had a big impact on the trajectory of his season because you saw when they were both healthy and the offense was clicking a little bit more, right? Every, I don't think that the offense was clicking. I think the players were just more familiar with them with each other, and they were trusting each other a lot more. I think the offensive system was still blech, but I did think that the players clicked a lot more despite the system, right? It wasn't. That's why I was never really worried about the Saints not making an offensive coordinator change, because that was the Saints players operating, executing, and producing despite the system, not the system getting right, right? So I look at Juwan Johnson as being in that mold of the guys that really kind of started to get it going towards the end of the season as everything came together. Now you're introducing a new offensive system in 2024, so things might get a little shaky. But the thing that I'm choosing to to look at here is if you're looking at breakout players, you want to see momentum from one year into the next. Juwan Johnson, another guy that started to build some of that momentum towards the end of the season, just like he did back in 2022. Now let's see if he can carry it into the immediate production that you're looking for in the following season here in 2024. And for his future, he'll need that as well. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at a a big time battle on the way, one that we kind of expected, but now have a very clear path to see, and that's at Kicker. We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. They've got everything that you're looking for over at FanDuel. They're going to help you make every moment more, whether you're betting on the tournaments, whether you're betting on the MLB, uh, 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 NBA, NHL, whatever it is that you're looking for, you're going to be able to find it over at FanDuel. And right now, new customers are going to make, find it even easier to get in on the action because as a new customer, you're going to get $200 in bonus bets. By winning your first $5 bet, that's it, 200 bucks that you can then turn around and use on any of those sports that we mentioned, point spreads, money lines, wherever it is that you're looking for, including exclusive props. 
as well. And I'll give you a quick money line that you're looking at for Friday, the NCAA Women's Final Four, the Cinderella story of North Carolina State going up against South Carolina. South Carolina favored 11 and a half. So maybe that's that big favorite you put your first $5 on, get those immediate 40 to one odds. Just an idea, something for you to go and check out unless you're worried about the upset there. Either way, you can visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make sure that you, you and your first bet is a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Let's get it. Who that Nation, appreciate you very much as always. Be here for another episode of Locked on Saints. What an incredible story Charlie Smith is, New Orleans Saints' newest kicker, who is not showing up just for the sake of landing on a practice squad and for you know even just getting to the NFL facility, which alone is a dream come true. He's here to compete. So we're going to be discussing a little bit about what that could mean for the New Orleans Saints. Appreciate you very much for being here. Don't forget, we are your team every day. So we'll be back here with you for a fresh episode tomorrow on Wednesday. Keep me up to date with everything going on around your New Orleans Saints, including we're also going to be getting back to what we've been doing every year, which is our midweek fundamentals. So on Wednesday, what I want to do is take a look at draft pick trade value, compensatory selections, things like that. Just get you some of the basic things that you need to know around the NFL draft. It's not really about the picks, but how all these things come together, how trades come together, all of that. So we're going to be breaking all of that down. And if you're interested, I'm doing a Bleacher Report live stream at 1 p.m. later on today, on Tuesday. I have another one next week uh, that you can find on the Bleacher Report app going through the Saints' biggest draft needs, team needs, stuff like that that we've already talked about here on this show. But you can go and find more of it over on Bleacher Report as well. So, all right. So um, next thing that I wanted to look at here. Oh, and by the way, I do have one other player that the New Orleans Saints do need a breakout for. So I'm going to get to that as well. But I want to hit this, this Charlie Smith story here because I just think this is stupid cool. I just think this is stupid cool. So Charlie Smith is a former down goalkeeper playing in, you know, he's from Ireland, uh, played a little bit of like Gaelic football as well, where the rules are, are slightly different. He did a press, you know, he did his media availability, his introductory press conference with us uh, yesterday. He is now signed with the New Orleans Saints. He went through the NFL's international player program. So basically what this does is that it kind of opens up an opportunity for players that aren't here in the United States to be seen by NFL coaches, scouts, stuff like that. Um, he went through this program as one of the, as a part of the inaugural class of Irish athletes. So it was about him and maybe four or five other athletes spent some other time with like tag leader and stuff like that, who was on loan with the rugby gold years ago and all these other things. I'm a, I'm, I'm learning a little bit. Okay. When it comes to rugby, when it comes, I've always been an Aussie rules football fan and everything like that. I've always been an AFL fan, but learn a little bit more about rugby and all these other things. So forgive me if I say any of these things and, and really even just like non-American football, right. Uh, in any way. Uh, so if I get any of these terms wrong, please forgive me, but I'm going to do my best to learn as we go through. But the thing that I really want to highlight here is what this means from the American football side of it all. Okay. Um, Charlie Smith coming in is an awesome story, right? Guy wrote letters, DMs on Instagram to the NFL, uh, DMs. I'm sure he probably, I don't know. I would have used LinkedIn trying to write to it. Like he just did everything right. And he was like trying to do that. You could even go to the NFL UK page who, uh, had, a, had started following him at one point. So he sent them a DM as well to kind of like just try to let everybody know, hey, this is a dream of mine. This is something that I want to do. So when he decided that he wanted to go the route of American football, learning how to kick all these other things, uh, spent some time working out at USF down in South Florida. During that time, Darren Rizzi went out and kind of got to know him, saw him there a little bit. And then it led to more and more opportunities. I think if I remember correctly, he was saying that that happened a little bit before the combine. Then he was like, the only, maybe one of the only place kickers at the combine ends up doing a, a local day with New Orleans or, or a pro day with New Orleans and then get signed by the New Orleans Saints. Now, he doesn't have to go through the whole draft process because of the inter, uh, the international player pathway program. You can just go in and sign with the team. We've seen the Saints utilize this program before. I think we just watched the New Kansas City Chiefs utilize this program as well. So just a really cool story. I mean, this is a guy that grew up wanting everything that we wanted, right? Like any of us that are football fans, that are sports fans of any kind, generally speaking, we grew up with a dream of playing sports. I know I did and everything. This guy did that same thing, but from an entirely different continent, from an entirely different country and made it happen, which is just awesome, like stupid cool. And here's the thing that I love about talking to Charlie Smith when we spoke to him yesterday in his Zoom uh, uh, introductory press conference. 
he said, I'm not, and this was in response to a question from uh, Fletcher Mackle. Um, he said, I'm not here. I didn't just go through the inter international uh, player pathway program or the IPP uh, to sit on a practice squad for three years. We're going to talk about the significance of a three-year contract here in a second. Uh, but I didn't just do that just to sit on a practice squad for three years. I want to play. And so make no mistake about it, we're in for another kicker competition here in New Orleans. We just watched Blake Groupie last year knock off Will Lutz to the point where the Saints traded Will Lutz to the Denver Broncos. Then there were a lot of question marks about whether or not they made the right choice, but then things kind of curved and made a lot more sense towards the end of the season where Blake Groupie was you know, a lot more consistent, a lot more reliable towards the end of the year. Uh, but Charlie Smith can kick a 64 yard field goal, right? So like, there's always going to be that sort of like charge of like, well, I saw this social media clip of this player doing this thing. That must mean that he's amazing. We're going to see, okay. We're going to see what he actually is once he gets to training camp with the Saints and all that kind of stuff. We might even get some looks. We got mini camp and OTA and stuff like that. I'll be there for all of that. We'll get through all of that together. Um, but I mean, we're going to get a look at it. And I'm really excited because, look, I do think that the kid is talented. I mean, you can watch him kick. You can see some of his stuff from the combine. You can see some of his stuff from, you know, his workouts and everything like that. Did a really good job of having like a social media or I guess NFL UK and stuff like that helped with having a social media presence and everything like that and kind of drive some of the hype. Uh, but can he do it consistently, right? That's going to be the biggest thing. I don't need you to kick 64-yard field goals all the time, right? I need you to be able to make 40 to 49. That's where I need your sweet spot to be. I need you to be automatic from 40 to 49. If you can be automatic from 40 to 49, you're going to have a long career in the NFL, long career in the NFL. And that's one of, the, that's one of those ranges where early on in the season, Blake Groupie struggled, right? You need to be consistent there. So it's going to be interesting to kind of watch both of these guys kind of go through. It will be a battle. As we know, the New Orleans Saints will not be afraid to choose the guy that they think is the better kicker over the incumbent guy. We just watched him do that. This isn't unique. They have kicker competitions every year, but we'll see how electrifying this one is. Um, the significance of the three-year contract, just so that you know. So they're all league minimums, all three years. Thank you, Kat Terrell, for that. Uh, but the reason why you do a three-year contract is not because you're already expecting him to not Blake Groupie off. It's just you want to be ready if he does. It, giving somebody a three-year contract doesn't really mean that it's a three-year contract. You got to know how much of that is guaranteed, all those other things. And we're dealing with a contract that for three years is league minimum, probably not a lot of it is guaranteed. So if he doesn't win the competition, you cut him and all that money, nothing happens, right? You just reset back to the books. Um, if you, but if he wins the competition, you can sign him or you keep him on the team, you move on from Blake Groupie and boom, you have your kicker on contract for three years. So the three-year contract isn't about what happens before the battle, it isn't about what happens if he loses the battle, it's if he wins it. You want to be ready for that. So that's why the Saints gave him a three-year contract. My last breakout candidate that I think the New Orleans Saints will need a breakout candidate, will need a breakout year from, and I won't go super into detail on this, but because we can come back to it another episode, but Alante Taylor. Alante Taylor in the in the slot, if he's going to be there in the slot, um, you know, with Paul Sadibo and Marshawn Lattimore, if the unthinkable happens and the Saints actually do trade Marshawn Lattimore, then obviously you need a breakout season from Alante Taylor on the outside as well. I think Alante Taylor can be a jersey seller here in New Orleans. I really do. Like if he ends up being as good a player as he clearly has the ability to be, he's going to sell some jerseys here in New Orleans. And I do think that that's important. All right. I appreciate you very much for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day, every day for your second listen. Locked On Pelicans, Locked On LSU, both with some sad episodes today. All right. Both some sad episodes, but go and check them out, especially Locked On LSU to celebrate another phenomenal season of LSU women's basketball, even though it got cut short by a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, performance by Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Make sure you go and check that out. We appreciate you very much. As always, making Locked On Saints a part of your day, part of your routine. You're saying yes to me on the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. If you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media, at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you. 